This is what you call a recording industry black. A platinum selling album in South Africa selling at around 125 rands per copy makes around 5 million rands. But the dark side of this money is most artists don't even see 10% of that money. You're not gonna make a cent until everything you do pays them back that $10 million. I still have to wait for a month and do you know in one gig you probably made your salary. After selling over 40,000 copies of Avery, MT would have made more than a million rands in royalties from that album alone and probably millions more from his gigs but he was allegedly caught in a scam record deal that paid him a monthly salary of less than 20,000 rand per month. That's not even all. The queen of South African pop Brenda Farsi is said to have blown 10 million rands in nine years, regularly spending in the six figures after making more than 30 million rands throughout her career. The darkness of the music industry never fades, honest. The more you dig, the more you are bound to find. I never surrender, you know? And what people think my weaknesses are, or what they, they don't expect me to do. Zahara's iconic album sold more than 500,000 copies. She has claimed that the record label robbed her of most of her money. Meanwhile, the record label says she is the one who owes them money. Diving into these titanic stories left me stunned and heartbroken. Even when I move further into my search for the truth and finding alleged information about Mavala noise being used for money laundering in the past, by its politician founder, then there is ambitious entertainment and their very ambitious endeavors of, of allegedly scamming their artists into shady deals and award shows shunning a risk after he left ambitious. After he left ambitious. The South African music business will never cease to amaze me, but it's definitely about to amaze you all. And stuff. It was me, him, Flame, that's who I remember. And then he was like, yo, you can't even be your ultimate self as an artist in this label because you just, you marginalized, you know? Like I was tired and I don't get tired. You know, I'm a hustler. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, no man, here I'm working, I'm working too much. Man. Mm. If you have never heard these songs before, then you were either born recently or you never grew up in Southern Africa in the 2000s and early 2010s. Everyone played the heck out of Brenda Fass's songs for decades. Because even when I was a kid, I would hear her, I would hear a few of her songs all the time. When Americans had Michael Jackson, I basically had Brenda Farsi. So it didn't really come as a shock or as a surprise when I found out that during the span of her career, she made more than 30 million rands which is unbelievable even by today's standards. When you check the best-selling albums country by country, you will realize that Brenda Fass's album Memeza sold 700,000 copies. Considering that you need to sell only 40,000 copies to be certified platinum, then it's safe to say she was getting diamond after diamond certification. It's still unbelievable how many units the queen of South African pop was moving. Do you actually think that's the head? Nah. She has three albums in the top five best-selling albums of all time in South Africa. Amatlozi sold 350,000 copies. Nomaganjani sold 350,000 copies. Nomaganjani gives me such strong childhood memories. My point in telling you all this information, besides the fact that Brenda Fassi was a record-selling machine, and the kind we shall never witness again, I wanted to paint a picture for you guys to understand that when I say Brenda Fassi, I am not talking about a small name, our own local version of Michael Jackson, when it comes to her value in record sales. I'm actually shocked why she never made as much as 50 million rands in her career. But because of the toxicity of the music industry and bad influences, she allegedly blew all the money she made and didn't make as much as she could have made. According to her 
former producer. She went on to blow 10 million rands in nine years, as I said before, but this happened between July 1995 and February 2004. As an example of how rich she was, on one of her payments, she was given 719,000 rands. Silo Chico Twala, her producer during the most successful period of her career, said he believed Brenda could have made well over 30 million rands in her 21 year career, which I strongly agree with. I believe she would have made around the regions of 50 to 100 million rands. However, when she passed away, donations had to be sought out to cover her medical bills and funeral costs, suggesting she passed away broke, sadly. Funds were raised in the form of a prayer line which turned into a condolences line. The life of Brenda has a lesson to teach people about the forces behind fame and publicity and how once these musicians succeed, they never wanted to be told no. Michael Jackson's brother Jermaine once said that they would spend very little time with Michael Jackson. They wouldn't even see him at some point in time because he would surround himself with people that always said yes to him or he loved being around yes men. He didn't want to be told no or be corrected, which I believe leads to the downfall of a lot of musicians, even here in South Africa. During this wave of Amma Piano, they just might be an artist making millions right now, spending recklessly and not listening to anyone telling them no. My humble advice is be smart. Another valuable lesson you can learn from artists like Brenda Fassi and Lucky Dube is the importance of owning at least a percentage of your masters. What if your music becomes timeless and you actually can't reap the rewards of the fruits of your labor? Like how Ambitious allegedly owns the entirety of MT's estate. Another heartbreaking case that clearly shows the dark side of the music industry here in South Africa is the story of Zahara. Zahara is another name from my childhood as well, especially the times when I used to hear songs like Lollywe and Deza. Those songs were literally everywhere. And to this day, I still know most of the lyrics word by word. When we talk about queen level of fame, we're talking about Zahara and Brenda Farsi. Zahara made millions of rands from gigs and TV royalties when she was at the peak of her career. As her album Lolly was sold more than 500,000 copies. DJ Spoo released a statement saying Zahara had a 50-50 royalty split with her record label, which is insane for a modern day record label to give away that much royalties. But it might be true though. I kind of find that hard to believe, but let's assume that it's actually true for a second. Let's say she got 50% from 500,000 copies selling at 100 rand per album. That would mean she would have made 25 million rands from that album alone. Are you telling me she blew 25 million rands? Cause that would be wild. If it's true, then this is yet another sign why artists need people around them who are willing to tell them no or give them sound advice. We hear allegations about how these businessmen behind these record labels tend to get these artists into some really dodgy record deals and scam them of what they actually deserve. As much as DJ Spoo might also be right in this Zahara saga, just don't outright disregard any statements that Zahara also says. She's a human as well and she must also be heard. Just remember, we like you. You come to the office, nine to five, right? You make millions for the company, but you walk away end of the month with 10,000. Whilst you were working the whole month and you made millions and millions for the company, but you walk away end of the month with 10,000. So it's like with us as artists, it's not like what you see, what you think you see. It's not what you see because you see it on TV. Yeah. Our music business has a very strong trace of malice and shady business deals. So people need to move with caution. Treating artists unfairly is what always leads to the eventual downfall of a recording business. It's always the same in every industry. Take Twitch for example. It doesn't give its creators the kind of attention and love that YouTube gives. So this is leading to many creators flocking to YouTube to use it as their primary streaming platform. When Zahara appeared on Metro FM, she told more flavor that she would sometimes get a mere 10,000 rands. You guys will understand clearly just how related these stories actually are. It's a web of similar stories. MT was paid a salary monthly instead of getting royalties. So this dodgy practice is not a new thing. It's been happening to artists, but Zahara's story is a very tricky one. You can never be sure whether she's on the right side or the record label is on the right side. Seeing Zahara suffering though is really heartbreaking to me personally because Zahara is the princess of South African pop music. A beacon of hope we needed after the passing of Brenda Farsi. Seeing her on such a financial downward spiral is just heartbreaking. During the pandemic when, during the pandemic she was down so bad that she had to get donations to help her out after the passing of her sister, which is a very, very, very sad situation. Lady Do offered a helping hand because Lady Do has always spoken about how she is being careful with her finances, especially the money she makes from gigs. 
Lady Do is very smart. That is one thing I can say. If I can tell you one thing about the music industry in South Africa, we can easily forget you. We can actually forget you as quickly as you blew up. Artists tend to be inconsistent and some get lost in their fame and publicity. And since we lack the appropriate financial education, they blow most of the money or they accumulate massive amounts of debt. Like what happened to Zahara and Brenda Farsi. Zahara was even planning to auction her 1.9 million rent house because she couldn't afford paying for it anymore. We are talking about an iconic artist that sold 500,000 copies with a single album, one of the best selling albums of all time here in South Africa. Was Zahara a victim of the alleged ambitious effect or is it a case of financial mismanagement? I honestly wouldn't tell you with confidence. But all I know is there is no major record label paying an artist 50% in royalties. DJ Spoo said something very interesting. He said Zahara is the one who owes the record label. I'm sure many of you are wondering, how can an artist owe a record label money? Well, let's try to dive into this rabbit hole. Firstly, let me help you understand what music royalties are or what mechanical royalties are. Mechanical royalties are generated through physical or digital reproduction and distribution of your copyrighted songs. This applies to all music formats, old and new, such as vinyl, CD, cassette, digital downloads and streaming through digital service providers like Spotify and Apple Music. Record labels pay a mechanical royalty to a songwriter every time they reproduce and sell a CD of their music. Mechanical royalties are usually paid out by your record label if you are signed or through your musical distribution service if you are independent. When talking about music royalties for performing artists, there's a range of acceptable amounts based on your clout as an artist. By clout, I mean how many fans you have and your command over earning an income from your fan base. If you're a new artist, your clout will be low, but if you have a lot of buzz, this can quickly increase your clout level to compare with other mid-level artists. And then finally, we have the superstars who are already commanding millions of streams and making lots of money for their managers and labels. That is how your royalty rate is determined. By United States standards, if you are a new artist, you might fall anywhere from 13 to 16 percent. For a mid-level artist who has sold over 100,000 albums, you can command 15 to 18 percent. The superstar artists that are at the top of the industry can command anywhere upwards of 18 to 20 percent. Never will you see a 50 percent cut from a major record deal. But if you sign to an indie record label, your cut could go as high as 50 percent. There was a time when rapper Lil Uzi Vert went on a social media rampage because his record label gave him a 20 percent royalty cut from the profits of his song exo tour life which made around 4.5 million at the time if only he knew artists here in south africa were getting a monthly salary of 20,000 rands instead of a percentage split then he would be very humble and grateful of what he's getting all these artists who sign a record deal here in south africa should always aim to maintain as much from their gigs and tour revenue as possible avoid 360 deals because they won't be making a lot of money from their music, especially since the rise of Spotify and streaming in general. Musicians stood a chance at making a lot of money when selling physical copies in the past. This is why when Adele released her album 25, streaming was put on pause for a number of weeks to allow the album to sell as much as possible through physical copies and digital downloads. Then when the steam ran out, that's when they made the album available for streaming. This is also another reason why Marvel movies aren't available for streaming on Disney Plus until it finishes its run at cinemas, physical will always sell more than streaming. Another fun fact about streaming, the major record labels namely Universal, Sony and Warner Music are alleged to all have a share on Spotify. Once you sign the traditional record deal, you owe the record label. As a homage to pay tribute to our beautiful musical history, let me introduce you to the biggest musician in South Africa and the biggest from South African history, Lucky Dube. I found myself listening to his music this morning before writing this script right here. I was always afraid of his music because it makes me quite sad and also it makes me think about my late sister who passed away in 2020. I always run away from nostalgia but this man is one of a kind. The record label didn't actually finesse Lil Uzi Vert if we go back to that situation. He signed the record deal and he got his percentage of the cut. It's the same situation with MT, it's the same situation with many artists. The way artists make up for this huge cut they lose in royalties is by going on gigs, bookings, and going on tours. You get some artists like Taylor Swift, U2, Elton John, Michael Jackson who throw massive stadium concerts and make way more money than what record labels make 
from selling their albums and singles. More of the public know that 90% of artists don't make that much from their music. You get unicorns like Taylor Swift, Adele, who make a lot of money from their albums because of the massive cloud they have and the bargaining power that they have when it comes to negotiating with record labels. Here in South Africa, there are some unicorns as well who made a lot of money from royalties alone. Brenda Farsi, Zahara with her album Loliwe, Lucky Dube, Mafiji Zolo, Questa with his album Dakar, maybe even names like Casper aka Nasty C, Scorpion Kings, Basta 929, Big Zulu, and Java with his recent album and other independent names like Aries and Shane Eagle. So yes, the South African music industry might be dark and twisted, but it has a big beautiful side as well for an artist that manages to build a loyal fan base. But we haven't reached the truly dark parts yet. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this cave. Matatiele in the Eastern Cape, Mtembeni Ndevu's talent was discovered after he won a talent competition in primary school and further brewed in the streets of... Being a kid from Matatiele and growing up in the streets of Beria, I don't blame MT for his decision because desperation always puts us at a disadvantage when it comes to the business of negotiations. Allegedly, the CEO of Ambitious knew he had leverage over MT because he knew MT's situation. Having a baby on the way, even I would have made the same decision that MT made even if I had financial education and knowledge about music royalties. At times, family has to come first. No matter what Instagram tells you, you can't always put yourself first and you can't always be selfish. That's the modern day American culture messing with African family values. The musicians here in South Africa are supposed to get at least 20% in royalties from their music, while record labels tax around 80%. But you will rarely see that happen. This is why people must respect DJ Maporiza for what he has built during the Amapiano era. From the outside looking in, it seems like he pays his major artists very well. The alleged tales of ambitious are never ending. They are the most controversial record label in South Africa. A day rarely passes without ambitious Twitter account dishing out some underhanded replies and also some comments about former artists even considering the fact that the public sees them as a shell of their former selves. Ambitious are a lesson on how to build an empire loved by a nation and destroy it faster than you built it. How did this inspirational titanic business story get to this point? Before Ambitious Entertainment, the music industry here in South Africa was mostly spearheaded by the world's big three, Warner, Sony and Universal. No one ever thought there would be a possibility of seeing local record labels taking a share of the revenue in the South African music business. Ambitious came to my attention when Benchmark released the song Bonang. Hey, Bonang. Which instantly became a pop culture hit. You either talked about the song itself or you talked about the girl in the music. The good times when Trace and MTV Bass actually cared about our taste in music as well as what the public love to see before they allegedly started playing mostly music from artists that actually paid for plays. This destroys the value of actively listening to music via those DSTV channels because you can't go from a hit song or a talented popular artist and then play some boring unknown song. That really kills the vibe. After Benchmark took off, I believe the next artist I saw was MT when his song Roll Up started making waves. And when I say waves, I mean waves. Roll up hit us so hard because our generation didn't have popular rappers around our age group to look up to. According to MT and other sources, Ambitious would then go on to make millions of Roll up and Avery since they allegedly took 100% of everything MT put out there and paid him a salary of less than 20,000 grand. Ambitious seemed to then adopt this business model when they tried it with Aries, but Rhys decided to think about the offer and took the most dangerous decision of his life, dropping the titanic Ambitious deal, which led to them getting angry, because if you have followed the history of Ambitious, their breakups are never clean. I'm sure you all know what happened next. When Aries released the song On My Own, and the song Minual in Hanichu, he became even more popular than when he was at the record label. I know the ropes, the game in the chokehold. Can you hear the gas I covered the slopes, now I'm on a straight road. At the peak of their powers, Ambitious had gigantic names like Benchmark, Aries, Black Diamond, Miss Pro, Fifi Cooper, Java, Saudi, Pretty Ugly, MT, Amanda Black. You won't find a better lineup than that. I can promise you that, bro. Ambitious literally took over the South African music scene at South African music scene to a point that good music was associated with this record label. I loved everything released by Ambitious. 
and the proof of that fact is that their youtube channel was the fastest growing in the country at one point but those alleged shady deals and contracts came to hit them so hard that everyone who knows these allegations really hates ambitious according to the artists they literally confiscated all the awards won by artists like MT and Amanda Black. The only thing that has kept them afloat after their golden era is because they are golden touch in pushing artists and knowing what the South African audience wants to hear. Big Zulu even adopted this style and it's been making him explode. Even Master KG does the same thing. The one thing we can be grateful to Ambitious for, they gave the South African music industry back to our local artists and record labels. During the era of Ambitious Dominus, there was also another story happening at the same time. Mavala Noise was on the rise in Durban and they wanted to completely destroy Ambitious. Mavala Noise strategy was completely different from the one used by Ambitious. While Ambitious was remarkably good at blowing up a new artist, Mavala Noise signed a lot. I mean a lot of popular artists in the music business. No one even asked how the heck did this unknown record label get these big names in the music industry and entertainment business. Mavala wanted to take a huge chunk of the market share that Ambitious was starting to control at a point in time. But things didn't go so well for them. In 2016, the Hawks launched an investigation after the EFF made allegations of fraud against Mavala Noise. This was immediately after the record label signed over 22 established artists. When investigations started getting heated, the founders decided to dip. Apparently, this man who co-founded the company was a member of the ruling party here in South Africa. And so Malema was accusing him of allegedly taking state funds and using the money to pay these artists big advances so they would sign with his record label. Apparently, they say he was even paying some artists around 5 million rands. The instability led to artists leaving the company and signing new deals with competitors. 